Number three, The Conjured Chest. Beverly Main Keensel grew up with a mahogany chest that has been dubbed one of the deadliest pieces of furniture in the world. The Conjured Chest was created sometime around 1830 in Kentucky, possibly in Meade County. At the time, Jeremiah Graham was expecting a child, so he ordered one of his slaves, a man named Remus, to build a chest for the unborn child. As an aside, some accounts named Jacob Cooley as the slaveholder. For this story, we use the book The Conjured Chest written by Beverly Main Kunzel because she's a descendant of the family and grew up with the chest and she refers to the slaveholder as Jeremiah Graham. Jeremiah wasn't satisfied with the chest and sadly, he beat Remus to death for not doing a good enough job. In retaliation, the other slaves performed a conjure by spreading an owl's blood inside the drawers, singing a mournful song and summoning evil. The chest then supposedly became cursed. Despite not liking the chest enough to beat Remus to death, for unknown reasons, Jeremiah kept the chest. Jeremiah's wife gave birth to a son. But tragically, the infant died after his clothes were placed in the chest. Jeremiah's brother, Jonathan, also had a son. Around the son's 21st birthday, he was stabbed and died. His clothes had also been put in the chest. The next victims of the chest were John Ryan, an Irish immigrant, and his wife, Catherine. They lived on land that belonged to the Graham family, and they received the chest, which they both used. They lost all their money and became poverty stricken. Catherine became ill and died. John planned to find work in New Orleans, but he died in an accident before he could. The chest was passed down through the family for generations. Apparently, each person who used the chest died not long after using it, including babies. The chest eventually ended up with Virginia Carey Hudson Cleveland in Louisville. In 1915, Virginia put her first baby's clothes in the chest. Her baby was born premature on August 8, 1915, and he died the same day. The baby was the chest's 12th victim. Virginia went on to have another daughter, also named Virginia, and she married a man named William Brister in 1943. Wilbur died a year later at the age of 31 from complications from an overdose. Virginia Cleveland's son, Richard, died in the 1940s after he was stabbed through the hand at school. He had put his clothes in the chest less than a week earlier. Richard was the 16th victim. By this point, Virginia had enough of the chest and its curse. Virginia asked her maid, Sally, how to break the curse. Sally said they needed a dead owl gifted by someone without asking for it. Then they needed it to boil leaves off a willow tree that a friend planted. The leaves would have to boil from sun up to sundown. Next, Sally said they needed to put the boiled liquid in a jug and bury it facing east under a flowering bush because the sun rises in the east and the devil hates the light. Virginia remembered her friend brought them a stuffed owl as a gift, which she already had in her home. Her friend had a willow tree, and she plucked 16 leaves. Sally said if they really did manage to break the curse, one of them would die when the leaves in the lilac bush dropped. Sally had a heart attack, recovered, and then died in September 1946, which is when the lilac leaves had fallen. Beverly May Keensel grew up with a codger chest in a room upstairs. Her mother told her not to open the drawers on the chest. When Beverly asked her mother why, she said, it's only for people who have died. They moved into this house in 1960, and the chest came with them from Kentucky to Maryland. When Beverly married her husband, her family offered her some furniture. Beverly refused to take the chest. Her mom kept it and retired to Florida. 
It was eventually given to the Kentucky Historical Society in 1976. In the book, The Conjured Chest, A Cursed Family in Old Kentucky, Beverly wrote that her descendants died because of slave owners' violent hatred. She wrote the beauty of a magnificent object fashioned skillfully under cruel compulsion contrasts poignantly with the atrocities and justice of slavery and the suffering of innocent victims. Number 2. Rudolph Valentino's Ring Rudolph Valentino was an actor with volatile luck. He grew up in Italy and moved to Paris in 1912 when he was 17. He couldn't find work though and he ended up begging on the streets for money. He went to New York City the following year where he landed menial jobs. He eventually got a job as a nightclub dancer. He then relocated to San Francisco, California for his dancing career. He made his way to Hollywood in 1917. He got the attention of screenwriter Gene Mathis who got his breakout role playing Julio in Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse in 1921. Afterward, he started a few romantic dramas and earned the nickname The Great Lover. One day in the prime of his career, Valentino was in a jewelry shop and he came across a silver ring with a semi-precious stone. The shopkeeper didn't want to sell the ring because he said it was cursed and had killed its previous owners. The shopkeeper called it the Ring of Destiny. It was a silver ring with a tiger's eye in the center. Nevertheless, Valentino managed to convince the shopkeeper to sell it to him. Then, after a long, successful career, things started to go wrong for Valentino. In 1922, he wore the ring on the set while filming The Young Raja, a silent black and white film about a farmer who learns he's a prince in India and returns to reclaim his throne. The film was a total flop. In 1926, Valentino starred in the silent romantic drama The Son of the Sheik. He was wearing the ring at his hotel during the premiere, then his gut started to hurt, so he went to the hospital. Doctors discovered his stomach was full of ulcers. He died a week later, on August 23, 1926, from a ruptured ulcer at the age of 31. Around 100,000 people were outside the funeral home at his service. Several women killed themselves over his death. He was buried at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Some visitors have said they have seen his ghost. The ring was then given to his partner, Hula Negri. She held her own as a silent film star. Just like Valentino, she became somewhat of a sex symbol for her roles as femme fatales. As soon as she got a hold of the ring, she became ill. Then she passed the ring along to the next victim. Russ Colombo. Colombo was an actor and singer. On September 3, 1934, Colombo was at the home of his best friend, a portrait photographer named Lansing Brown. Brown was showing Colombo a pistol when he dropped a lit match on the cap which fired the pistol. The bullet hit a wind dresser, ricocheted, and hit Colombo above the eye. He was taken to the hospital, but died before his operation. He was 26 years old. The photographer was questioned by the police, but cleared of any responsibility. Brown was devastated by the accidental killing for the rest of his life. The ring somehow got into the hands of Colombo's friend, Joe Casino. Casino was an entertainer. He kept the ring under glass for months, wondering whether he should wear it. He eventually wore it, and then he was hit and killed by a truck. Joe's brother Dell then became the owner of the ring. A burglar named James Willis tried to steal the ring. Willis set off an alarm during the break-in, and the police shot him dead. Valentino's ring was allegedly in his pocket. The next ring holder was Jack Dunn, an actor who was supposed to play Valentino in a biopic. 
Lee contracted a blood disease and died before filming started. No one knows exactly where the ring is now, but it's rumored to be in a safety deposit box in a bank in Los Angeles, California. Number 1. The Cursing Stone With a name like the Cursing Stone, it's no surprise that this granite artwork is blamed for misfortune. In 1525, Gavin Dunbar, the Archbishop of Glasgow, Scotland, placed a curse on a group of raiders called the Border Reavers. Dunbar cursed them because the Reavers people lived in a lawless land between Scotland and England. They would pillage and rob the district. The curse is 1,069 words. Here is just a small sample. I curse them going and I curse them riding. I curse them standing and I curse them sitting. I curse them eating and I curse them drinking. I curse them riding and I curse them lying. I curse them at home. I curse them away from home. I curse them within the house. I curse them outside of the house. I curse their wives, their children, and their servants who participate in their deeds. I bring ill wishes upon their crops, their cattle, their wool, their sheep, their horses, their swine, their geese, their hens, and all their livestock. I bring ill wishes upon their halls, their chambers, their kitchens, their stations, their barns, their cow sheds, their barnyards, their cabbage patches, their plows, their harrows, and the goods and the houses that are necessary for sustenance and welfare. The curse was read aloud on every pulpit. However, the Reaver people were not intimidated and they did not stop their pillaging. In 1603, James VI of Scotland was crowned James I of England and King of Ireland. It was a union that united the areas and new law was imposed so that the Reavers could not have free reign. Even though the Reavers laughed at the curse, some people believe that the curse left a permanent mark on the area. Fast forward several centuries to 2001. Artist Gordon Young was commissioned by the city of Carlisle, England to create a Millennium Project. He inscribed Dunbar's curse on a 14-ton granite boulder with a long path with the names of the Reaver families. Young's ancestors were Reaver people and he said that the project would scrub out the evils the families committed. The boulder was placed in an underground walkway connecting a museum and a castle. It was supposed to be a cultural link between the two sites, but some people say it's cursed the city. Even before its installation, people were worried it would draw devil worshippers. People blame the cursed boulder for an outbreak of foot mouth disease. After its installation, some people believe that the curse was resurrected. In 2005, a flood killed three people and damaged 100,000 homes. A couple weeks later, a fire damaged a factory, putting 200 people's jobs in jeopardy. The cursing stone is playing for the Carlisle United soccer team losing its rank and was relegated to a lower rank in its division. Some people want the artwork destroyed and city councillors tried to make that happen. The Bishop of Carlisle even backed up other Christians who thought that the cursed stone brought back an evil force. But the city council rejected the motion in spring 2005. The cursing stone is still set up in the underpass today. Number 3. Christopher Case In April 1991, life was good for Christopher Case. The 35-year-old managed artist at a music company in Seattle, Washington. He was successful at work, had good friends, and didn't have any known enemies. But things took a bizarre turn after Case visited San Francisco. On April 11th, Case visited the California city on business. He met a woman who shared his love of ancient music. They had dinner together. At some point during the night, the woman tried to seduce Case. But he wasn't interested. The woman told Case that she was a witch and would curse him. 
She said, you'll be sorry and most likely be dead within a week. Case thought nothing of what the woman said and returned home to Seattle. That's when weird things started happening. Case heard whispers, saw shadows, woke up in the night feeling like hands were choking him. He even woke up with cuts and blood on his hands. Case thought that the witch was attacking him in his sleep. On April 14th, Case told friends that he was worried that the curse was real. Sammy Souter was one of the friends Case spoke with. Souter was a psychic and a teacher. Case left her a message saying, They're after me. I'm very, very afraid. Extremely afraid. I could die from this. They had been friends for about a decade. Souter knew Case to be healthy, stable, and someone who didn't believe in witchcraft. She told Case to get help. Case went to a bookstore looking for advice on witchcraft. A few days later, Souter hadn't heard from Case and she was worried. She called the police asking for a welfare check. Police officers visited Case's apartment a couple times, but there was no response. The door was locked and they couldn't get into the apartment. It's unclear what day they visited. What is known is that the police visited Case's apartment at some point on April 18th. This time, his door was unlocked. Police found Case's dead body in the bathtub. He was wearing his clothes and there was no water in the bathtub. Allegedly, police found Case in a prayer position. There were no signs of violence, foul play, or robbery. The police found 10 candles that had nearly been totally burned. They also found several crucifixes. There were several piles of kosher salt along the base of the walls throughout his apartment. There were also piles of salt in the corners of the walls and on the porch. Piles of salt are usually part of rituals to ward off evil forces. The police found letters Case had written. They contained similar things to what Case had told his friends, that witch cursed him and he was experiencing strange things in his apartment. An autopsy showed that Case died of myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle. It caused Case's heart to stop beating. Exactly what caused the myocarditis remains a mystery. But it's apparent that Christopher Case really believed that he was cursed by a witch. Number 2. The Jake Bird Hex Tacoma, Washington is about 35 miles south of Seattle. In 1947, the population of the city was around 140,000. 52-year-old Bertha Clutt lived there with her 17-year-old daughter, Beverly June Clutt. Beverly had just graduated from high school. Bertha was a baker. Bertha's husband, Edward, had died seven years earlier. On October 29, 1947, Beverly came home from a prayer meeting at about 10 p.m. At around 2.30 a.m., neighbors heard screams coming from the Clutt house. They called the police. When they drove up, they saw a man walking out of the Clutt's home. He was holding a knife in his shoes. He ran away and dropped a purse. The police chased him through an alley. A few officers caught up to him and the man stabbed them both. Eventually, the police caught the man and arrested him. They noticed that he had blood and brain tissue on his pants. The police went to the home of Bertha and Beverly. They found Beverly's body between the doorway of the kitchen and the dining room. She was lying on her face in a pool of blood. Police found an axe on the kitchen floor. They found Bertha's body in her bedroom, which was adjacent to the kitchen. Her body was so bloody they couldn't see most of her wounds. Her head was nearly severed. Based on the position of her body, the police believed she was sexually assaulted and then murdered. 
The man the police arrested was identified as 45-year-old Jake Bird. Before he left the scene, the police asked Bird what had happened. Bird said that he didn't commit the murders. Instead, he said his friend Leroy murdered Bertha and Beverly. The police didn't believe Bird and he was brought to jail. Bird eventually confessed to the murders of Bertha and Beverly Clyde. Bird said he only intended on robbing them. Before he entered their home, he grabbed an axe from their shed. He took off his shoes so he could sneak into their house quietly. He entered their house through an unlocked back door. He snuck into Bertha's bedroom while she was sleeping and stole her purse. But she woke up and tried to stop him. Bird said he tried to rape her. Bertha put up a fight and he panicked, so he hit her in the head with an axe. Bertha screamed. Bird then struck Bertha several more times with the axe. Beverly ran from the upstairs bedroom to the kitchen and Bird attacked her with the axe. She died in the doorway of the kitchen. Bertha and Beverly each had 16 cuts or lacerations. He then dropped the axe, left the home, and ran for the police. He had a knife on him, which he used to stab the two police officers. Bird was charged with first degree murder for the killing of Bertha Clyde. If he wasn't convicted of Bertha's murder, he would have been charged with Beverly Clyde's murder. Bird's trial started on November 24th and it lasted three days. He had pleaded not guilty. The jury found Bird guilty of first degree murder. Bird then confessed that he was involved in many other murders. He said he could clear up 44 murders from across the country. He wanted to share this information with the investigators in exchange for a life sentence instead of being executed. The district attorney didn't agree to give him a life sentence, but they did agree to delay his sentencing hearing to hear what Bird had to say. Bird then confessed to dozens of murders. The police were able to confirm 11 of the murders, but it's unclear exactly who all the victims were. What is known is that he committed three murders in Omaha, Nebraska in November 1928, three in South Bend, Indiana in September 1942, one in Ogden, Utah on October 3rd, 1947, one in Highland Park, Illinois, on June 24, 1942, and Bertha and Beverly Clutt. Bird killed many of his victims with an axe. While the police were investigating Bird's confessions, he appealed his conviction because he wanted a new trial. His request was denied. At Bird's sentencing hearing in December 1947, Judge E.D. Hodge sentenced Bird to death. He then asked Bird for a comment. Bird said that the people who had anything to do with his case would die before him. This became known as the Jake Bird Hex. One month after his sentencing, Judge Hodge died of a heart attack. He was in excellent health up to his death. In January 1948, Under Sheriff Joe Carpack interrogated Bird about some unsolved murders. In April 1948, he died of a heart attack. In January 1948, the court clerk, Ray Scott, also died of a heart attack. He hadn't missed a day of work because of illness in the five years he worked as a court clerk. On September 28, 1948, Detective Lyons died of a heart attack too. James W. Selden, Bird's attorney, had asked to be taken off Bird's case but he was ordered to finish the trial. Selden made it known that he was only defending Bird because he had to. He died of a heart attack in November 1948. Arthur A. Stoddard was a correctional officer who retired shortly after Bird's sentencing. He died on April 27, 1949. It's unknown how he died, but some people say it was from a heart attack. 47-year-old Jake Bird was hanged on July 15, 1949.
1949. There was one more tragedy seemingly connected to the hex after Bird's execution. Five months after he was executed, 47-year-old Helen Osborne was found dead in a cabin in rural Minnesota. She had been hacked to death with a hatchet. Her husband, 58-year-old Lloyd Osborne, was found dead, sitting behind a desk in the same room. On the desk was a handwritten note. Lloyd wrote he had a nightmare about Jake Bird and he didn't realize what he had done to Helen. He decided that killing himself was the easy way out. If there was a connection between Bird and the Osbournes besides Lloyd's dream, it has never been made public. Their death seemed to be the end of the Jake Bird hex. Number 1. Cursed Power Rangers The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers first aired in the United States in 1993. It's a live action series that follows five teenagers in the fictional city of Angel Grove. The teens transform into superheroes and fight villains like Rita Repulsa, a space witch. From there, it's expanded into a huge franchise that has 28 seasons of 21 variations of the show and three major motion pictures. Unfortunately, it turns out that some of the actors playing the superheroes of the shows were really villains themselves. A few of the actors have been involved in deaths, murders, and violence. The horrible trend is called the Power Rangers Curse. First, here are some of the tragic deaths. Tui Trang was part of the original cast that played the Yellow Ranger. On September 3rd, 2001, she was riding in a car in California. Someone else was driving. The car swerved off the road and hit a rock face. Sadly, Trang did not survive. She was just 27 years old. Bob Papenbrook was a voice actor on many of the Power Rangers seasons. He died of lung cancer at the age of 50 on March 17, 2006. Machiki Osoga was a voice actor and played several roles in the series, including Rita Repulsa. Soga died of pancreatic cancer on May 7, 2006. She was 68 years old. Edward Lawrence Albert played Mr. Collins in Power Rangers Time Force. That was the ninth season of the Power Rangers, which aired in 2001. On September 22, 2006, Albert died of lung cancer. He was 55 years old. Feather Rudder played the White Mystic Ranger in Power Rangers Mystic Force. That was the 14th season in 2006. She received a diagnosis of a brain tumor in 2010. Sadly, she died just two weeks later on July 20th, 2010. She was 55 years old. Robert L. Manahan voiced the character Zordon, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The 43-year-old died from a heart aneurysm on June 30th, 2000. Richard Janelli played Ernie in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The 47-year-old died of a heart attack on December 30th, 2008. Eric Ray Frank played the role of David Trueheart. He was the long-lost brother of Tommy Oliver on Power Rangers, Zio. This was the fourth season of the franchise in 1996. Frank died on April 16th, 2001 from an unspecified cause. He was only 29 years old. And now, here are three stories of murder and violence. Just a heads up, the first one deals with domestic violence. Bua Mungasiva played Shane Clark, the Red Wind Ranger, in the 11th season of the show. The first episode of the 11th season, which was called Power Rangers Ninja Storm, aired in 2003. Mugasiva was born in Samoa and later lived in New Zealand. Mugasiva met Liz Sadler on Instagram in October 2016. They married in spring 2018. 
They each had a daughter from a previous relationship. Sadler's seven-year-old daughter, Layla, lived with them. In May 2018, August Stephen Sadler visited Wellington, New Zealand. On the night of May 11th, Magasivo was drunk, angry, and he beat Sadler in their hotel room. He hit her head against the wall, and she started bleeding. In a day, she ran into the shower, but Magasiva kept punching her as she bled in the tub. She then went to the hospital. Magasiva was found dead by suicide in the hotel room in the early morning. He was 38 years old. After he died, Sadler revealed dark truths about their relationship. Two weeks before he died, Magasiva was sentenced to 70 hours of community work and six months of supervision for assaulting his wife. The incident happened in June 2018 after the two of them were at a restaurant with friends. Magasiva got mad about something Sadler said and he kicked her under the table. Sadler left the restaurant and went home. At around 11 p.m., Magasiva arrived home, drunk. He woke up Sadler, spat in her face, and said they wouldn't be going together on an upcoming trip to Australia. Magasiva went downstairs and had another drink. While Magasiva was downstairs, Sadler hid their passports. Magasiva found out that she hid them and got mad. He grabbed her arms and then hit himself in the face. Then he grabbed her neck and put her in a headlock. He then punched himself in the face again. Sadler said she would call the police, but Magasiva threw her phone and broke it. Sadler took a taxi to the police station and had bruises on her face and her neck. Magasiva's lawyer said that his behavior was out of character. But the lawyer also said that Megasiva had finished an anti-violence program, was seeing a therapist for alcoholism, and was in couples counseling. Megasiva was sentenced to 70 hours of community work and 6 months of supervision. The judge said that if Megasiva did anything like that again, he'd face strangulation charges. At the time of his sentencing, Megasiva's name, in this case, was kept secret to the public. Sadler couldn't talk about the abuse in public until the court order was lifted. The day it was lifted, she spoke to the media about her abuse. Sadly, this was not the only time there was violence in their relationship. In 2017, Mangasiva lost his license for drinking and driving, but he got on his motorcycle anyway. Sadler tried to stop him from driving. Megasiva got angry and he drove over her foot. Sadler's leg and foot were burned. Sadler had also suffered three concussions from Megasiva's attacks. He had also threatened to hurt Sadler's daughter. Layla, Sadler's young daughter, sometimes witnessed the domestic violence. Megasiva told Layla that he would kill her mother or himself if she went to the police. Sadler's father noticed holes in the walls around his daughter's home and would see bruises on her face. She would say that Megasiva was sorry and it wouldn't happen again, but sadly, it did. Sadler's father tried to intervene, but he feared that Megasiva would stop him from seeing his daughter and granddaughter. Sadler said she went public with her story because she wants other women to get help or to get out. She said she kept silent for too long and made excuses to protect him. Another tragic story for the Power Rangers is about Ricardo Medina Jr. who played Cole Evans, the Red Lion Wild Force Ranger in the 10th season of the show. Power Rangers Wild Force first aired in 2002. He also played Decker in the 2011 series Power Rangers Samurai. In late 2015, Medina moved in with Joshua Stutter in Palmdale, California. They were both 36 years old. Stutter loved animals and could fix anything. 
He helped his sister build and open the dog rescue and pet store in 2011 in Los Angeles. It was called Lucky Puppy. Sutter loved caring for the dogs at the store. Medina was hired to care for the animals at Lucky Puppy, but he was let go after he threatened to release the dogs into the wild. On January 31st, 2015, Sutter was on the phone with his father talking about growing organic vegetables to feed the dogs. Minutes later, just before 4 p.m., Medina and Sutter got into an argument over Medina's girlfriend. Allegedly, Sutter didn't want her at their apartment. Medina and Sutter got into a physical fight. Then Medina went to the bedroom with his girlfriend. Sutter forced Medina's bedroom door open. Medina stabbed Sutter multiple times in the abdomen with a sword that he kept in his room. Afterward, Medina called 911. Sutter was taken to the hospital and he was pronounced dead. Medina was immediately arrested and then later released because of lack of evidence. He was arrested again less than a year later. He claimed he acted in self-defense. In March 2017, Medina pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and he was sentenced to six years in prison. There are rumors that Medina has already been released from prison, but that information is unclear. Skyler De Leon was a childhood actor. At 14 years old, she appeared in one episode of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. She was an extra in the 1993 episode, Second Chance. Her career as an actor was rocky because she couldn't remember her lines. She later turned to a life of crime and spent time in jail for burglary. Skylar De Leon married Jennifer Henderson in 2002. This was before Skylar came out as a transgender woman. In early November 2004, Jennifer and Skylar were living in Long Beach, California. They saw an advertisement for a 55-foot yacht. The sellers were 47-year-old Jackie and 57-year-old Tom Hawks. They were a married couple from Arizona and they had lived on the yacht for a couple of years. They named their yacht Well Deserved. Tom was a retired probation officer, a Vietnam veteran. He spent decades saving money for his dream to live on a boat in retirement. Jackie was a homemaker, the gym rat herself. They lived a life of adventure together. But in 2004, they decided to sell their boat to spend more time with her grandchild. The asking price was $440,000. The Daily Owns responded to their ad. At first, Jennifer met up with the Hawks. She brought their nine-month-old baby to gain their trust. They agreed to meet the following week for a test sale on November 15th. Skylar met the Hawks in Newport Harbor. Skylar brought along Alonzo Machain and John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Skylar had met Machain when she was in jail for burglary. Machain was a guard at the jail and they became friends. Kennedy and the Daily Owns got in touch through a mutual friend. She roped them into this murder and robbery plot by promising them money. Once on the ocean, Machane threatened Jackie in the kitchen with a stun gun. Skylar and Kennedy overpowered Tom in the lower area of the boat. They handcuffed them in the bedroom. They were taken up to the main cabin to sign a document that would transfer ownership of the boat to Skylar. Then the Hawks were tied together and then tied to an anchor. Tragically, the grandparents were thrown overboard. Their bodies have never been found. The Hawks family and friends knew something was wrong. Tom's brother, Jim, went to Newport Beach and saw Well Deserved parked in its usual spot. Jim was a retired police officer. The Hawks car wasn't around and no one had heard from the couple. He left a note on the well-deserved with his phone number. 
Jennifer called Jim and said that they had paid for the boat in cash. Jim grew even more suspicious when he found out that there was no activity on the Hawks' bank account. If the Hawks had just made hundreds of thousands of dollars, they probably would have put it in their bank account. Jim called the police to report the couple missing. On November 27th, the police searched the yacht. They found a receipt for bleach and garbage bags dated November 17th. They tracked down the buyer of the bleach and the garbage bags. It was Jennifer DeLeon's father. On December 16th, the Hawks' abandoned car was found in Mexico. The police learned that Skyler was a convicted felon and she drove it there. The police looked at the paperwork for the sale of the yacht. Skyler and McChain signed it. The police interrogated Skyler. Shelby told the police that she purchased the boat with drug money. On December 17th, the police arrested the Daily Owns on money laundering charges. The police searched the Daily Owns home and found the Hawks' laptop and video camera. With all the evidence, the police were hot on their trail. Everything came together when Machine confessed to the murders. Ultimately, Skyler and Jennifer DeLeon, Alonzo Machine, and John Fitzgerald Kennedy were charged with the murders. Jennifer DeLeon went to trial in November 2006. She was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder and murder for financial gain. She received two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. John Fitzgerald Kennedy went to trial in 2018. He was convicted of first degree murder and murder for financial gain. He was sentenced to death. He is currently on death row at San Quentin State Prison. The death penalty was suspended in California in 2018. In 2019, Alonzo McShane pleaded guilty to two counts of voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison as part of a plea deal. He was a key witness at Skyler De Leon's trial. While awaiting trial, Skyler was charged with another murder. When the police had searched her home in the Hawks case, they found an interesting business card. It belonged to a Los Angeles police officer the liaisons with police in Mexico. The police officer was investigating the murder case of 45-year-old John Jarvie. Jarvie was found dead in Mexico in 2003. His throat had been slit. It turned out that Jarvie and Skyler knew each other. They had served time in jail together and stayed in touch when they were released. In 2003, Skyler convinced Jarvie to join her in a business deal. Jarvie ended up getting Skyler $50,000 in cash. They met in Mexico for the so-called business deal, but Jarvie ended up being killed. Skyler went to trial in October 2008 for all three murders. She was found guilty on all three counts of first-degree murder and she was sentenced to death. 42-year-old Skylar De Leon is on death row at San Quentin State Prison. In all, at least 11 actors from Power Rangers have succumbed to the curse so far. Number 3. The Guinnesses Dublin, Ireland, 1759 As a man named Arthur walked through the streets of his beloved hometown, he lamented the drunkenness and alcoholism that seemed to grip the city. And it was at that very moment that God himself parted the clouds and spoke to Arthur. He told the young man to do something about the state of men. He told him to brew a drink that it would actually be good for them instead. 
And that, according to legend, is how Arthur Guinness invented his world-famous Black Stoke Brew. Of course, this legend is highly suspicious. Likely, it was invented by some nascent marketing company. What's real, however, is the reception that ever since the day Arthur first pounded a cork into his first cast of Guinness, despite billions of dollars in sales over 200 plus years, he and generations of his family have endured a bitter curse to go along with its bitter brew. As with many Irish families of the time, Arthur and his wife had a lot of children. So many, in fact, that they could have dressed their own hockey team. Not just for a game, for an entire roster. Arthur and his wife, Olivia, had 21 children over the course of 22 years. Yet, tragically, only 10 of those children survived past their first birthday. Perhaps that's not so unusual for the time. Infant mortality rate was abysmal back then. But what is peculiar are the fates of the ancestors that sprang for that first generation. Those ten surviving children went forth and multiplied in a big way. So by the middle of the 20th century, more than a few hundred people could claim connections to the Guinness name. But that connection came with a price. Between 1965 and 1997, there were more than a dozen tragic deaths under the crest of Guinness. There were three car crashes, two suicides by jumping, and one accidental fall. Add to the mix AIDS, alcoholism, a kidnapping, a fatal asthma attack, a climbing accident, and even an assassination. In 1978 alone, the family endured six funerals. Four things to drug overdoses, one from yet another car accident, another for Lady Henrietta Guinness, who took her own life by hanging. As she wrote in her suicide note, if I had been poor, I would have been happy. But what caused such misery for the clan once dubbed Ireland's royal family? Many family members say are split on whether there is a so-called curse or not. Some chalk it up to sheer numbers. With so many people able to trace their lineage back to Arthur Guinness, there is bound to be a few broken branches on the family tree. But if there is a curse, one source for it may have come from the very first Guinness distillery in Dublin. Back in 1759, Arthur built his brewery very near where St. James Gate once stood. In ancient times, the gate was a sacred place to the Celts. They gathered there to bathe and anoint themselves in the adjacent wellspring, a holy well that had been blessed by the local clergy. Believers claim that the well's waters held miraculous powers of healing and blessing. But when Arthur Guinness took over the site for his brewery, he found that the water turned brackish and undrinkable. So he undertook a project that rerouted this once holy well water into pipes which he used to cool his fermented stout. Depending on who you ask, the use of this holy water, albeit indirectly, may have either made the brew attractive to the local faithful, increasing its popularity, or cursed Guinness and his entire family for generations to come. Number 2. The Habsburgs When conspiracy theorists talk about the Illuminati and the New World Order, they may be unknowingly talking about the Habsburg family. Dating back to the 1300s, this Vienna-based lineage has it all when it comes to shadowy secret empires. Rife with inbreeding and incest, the Habsburg family tree has boasted countless dukes, archdukes, counts, emperors, monarchs, and politicians. Even the family's treasure room is the stuff of legend, a legend that perhaps has cursed the family in its earliest days. During the 1400s in early Habsburg, Emperor Frederick III believed that Austria would one day rule the world. This destiny, he said, had been ordained by God. He believed that he and members of his family were God's representatives on earth. And soon, Frederick set out to conquer 
what was rightfully his. Though, instead of using a sword, he used a ring. Frederick systematically sent his children to marry into other great dynasties of Europe. These weddings consolidated and expanded not only his power, but his wealth. Thanks to the dowries associated with these marriages, the Habsburg's treasure hoard grew exponentially. It was through one marriage that the family obtained the precious gem that would eventually bring them to their knees, the Florentine diamond. Though the exact origins of this 136 carat bright yellow-green gem are unknown, what is known is that it was mined in India sometime around the 13th century. Some recount that it left India after it was stolen out of a temple to the Hindu goddess Sita. Much like another infamous cursed gem, the Hope Diamond. Legend says that the goddess cursed whomever came into possession of the stone as a punishment for the desecration of her temple. After it was stolen around 1615, the diamond found its way into the hands of Fernando II of the Medici dynasty. From there, the diamond passed through a few generations until the last Medici Grand Duke died in 1737. Taking over as ruler of the dynasty was the Holy Roman Empire, Francis I. His marriage to Habsburg Empress Marie Theresa of Austria then placed the Florentine diamond in the Habsburg's treasury. And within a few years, Francis and Theresa gifted the stone to their daughter, Marie Antoinette. Most students of history know that things didn't turn out well for Antoinette. And the same can be said for other members of her extended family over the years. Consider one example of this tragic lineage. On September 10, 1898, Empress Elizabeth of Austria was assassinated after she was stabbed with a long, hidden needle in the handle of an umbrella. Nine years earlier, in 1889, her son, 30-year-old Crown Prince Rudolf, and his 17-year-old mistress were discovered dead in his Hungarian hunting cabin slash love nest. It appeared Rudolf shot his lover and then himself. It's believed that it was either a murder-suicide or a suicide pact. But there are rumors that Rudolf's wife, Princess Stephanie, may have herself sought revenge not only for the affair, but for the fact that Rudolf had given her syphilis and left her unable to have children, not able to bear an heir to the Habsburg line. The Austro-Hungarian throne was handed over to Rudolf's paternal cousin, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and it was his assassination in 1914 that is said to have directly caused the First World War. From a stolen diamond in an Indian temple to 40 million casualties, that's a big body count for a curse. Ferdinand's death essentially ended the 800-year-old influence of the Habsburg family in Europe. While the family's considerable and priceless treasury today is housed in multiple museums in Austria, the stone that started it all is not among them. It went missing sometime in the 20th century. Today, troves of treasure hunters are still searching for the cursed gemstone, which is valued today at $20 million. But perhaps they should beware, because while finding it might bring them wealth, it could also come at a cost. The Kennedys No list of family curses would be complete without the inclusion of the Kennedys. Yet, while most, even with a passing knowledge of history, are probably familiar with the major tragedies that have befallen the Kennedy family. President John F. Kennedy assassinated in 1963 at the age of 46. His son, John F. Kennedy Jr., killed in a plane crash in 1999 at the age of 38. His brother, Bobby Kennedy, assassinated at age 42 in 1968. And his older brother, Ted Kennedy's drunken car crash that claimed the life of 28-year-old Mary Jo Kopechny in 1969. But there have been other, perhaps smaller, tragic instances within the Kennedy clan. Some that perhaps aren't as widely known. 
Mourning for the dynasty began in 1944 when Joe, the oldest son of Joseph P. and Rosemary, JFK's older brother, died at age 29 when his BQ-8 Liberator exploded over the English Channel during World War II. Four years later, his younger sister, Kathleen, also died in a plane crash. While flying with her husband, Lloyd Peter Fitzwilliam, their Delavaland dove hit some bad weather and slammed into a mountainside in the Rhone Valley. She was 28 years old. Ted also endured a plane crash before his fatal drunk driving crash. In 1966, while flying with four others, his chartered plane hit dense fog and a thunderstorm. After slicing the treetops near Springfield, Massachusetts, it went down in a heap. Of course, Ted survived, but the pilot and one other passenger were killed. So the hardships the Kennedy family had to endure wasn't as big as plane crashes and assassinations. In 1984, Bobby Kennedy's son, David, died of a drug overdose at the age of 28. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. also slipped into drug addiction. After the murder of his father, he developed a heroin habit that reached $1,000 a week by 1983. Today, though clean and sober, he suffers from dystonia, which affects the larynx and makes it difficult for him to speak clearly. In 2012, his wife, Mary, died of suicide at their home in Bedford, New York. She was 52 years old. Drug addiction also claimed the life of Shershaw Kennedy Hill, Bobby Kennedy's granddaughter, in 2019. She died of an accidental overdose at the Kennedy family compound at the age of 22. Four months later, Bobby's other granddaughter, 40-year-old Maeve, along with her 8-year-old son, Gideon, drowned when the canoe they were in overturned to Maryland. Bobby Kennedy's other son, Joe Kennedy II, meanwhile, was also struck with the so-called curse. In 1973, while driving an open-top Jeep with his brother, David, the Jeep flipped over. Though the Kennedy boys were okay, David's girlfriend was paralyzed in the crash. Joe and David's other brother, Michael, later died in 1997 at the age of 39 when he hit a tree while skiing in the Aspen Mountains. And even more, Kennedy tragedies were health-related. Cancer would claim the life of Jackie Kennedy in 1994. Some 30 years earlier, a respiratory disease claimed the life of her newborn son, Patrick. Brain cancer also finally fell Ted Kennedy in 2009. His son, Edward Jr., lost a leg to cancer in 1973 when he was 12 years old. And though she was afflicted with lung cancer, Ted's daughter, Kara, beat the disease, only to die of a sudden heart attack in 2011. Meanwhile, Ted's sister, Rosemary, was said to have been born with a learning disorder that her father tried to have fixed with a lobotomy in 1941. The procedure left her with brain damage. She passed away in 2005 at the age of 86. However, she lived the entirety of that long life in a Wisconsin institution. Some again might point out that so many tragedies are simply par for the course within large families that have multiple branches on their family trees. But there are others who say that there are ancient forces at work. The modern Kennedy clan dates back to 1740 in County Wexford, Ireland. According to lore, one Kennedy ancestor once destroyed a fairy fort on his land. These earthen mounds were said to be the remnants of dwellings of the ancient Celts. According to folklore, their destruction will result in a family curse. But branches of the Kennedy clan that stayed in Ireland have never reported anything close to the same kind of cursed line. So there's another school of thought that claims the curse is more recent and its origins in 1920s as Yom Shimia. Translated from Hebrew, the phrase the mystical Yiddish spell that essentially calls for someone's name to be erased. 
During the Great Depression, Patriarch Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr. was a notorious robber baron. There are countless examples of him manipulating stock prices so he could make millions. In the 20s, Joe Sr. once helped John Hertz muster some capital for his struggling yellow cab company in Chicago. Kennedy used his influence to artificially inflate the price of the company's stock. Then the two men sold high, making a fortune, before the stock price tanked. Hertz used his newfound millions to buy a rental car company. But Kennedy's shading dealings left the cab company's stockholders with worthless pieces of paper. Because those stockholders were primarily working class folks, and because the Chicago workforce at the time was composed of scores of Jewish immigrants, maybe it was one of those broken families who initiated the blight upon Joe Kennedy's name, manifesting misery for his children, and their children, and so on, down the line, until Joe Kennedy's name is eventually erased. Number 3. Tomino's Hell In 1917, 21-year-old graduate Yasuo Seijo found himself sitting on a bench at Tokyo University. As tears welled in his eyes, he read a telegram from Japan's military office informing him his father had been killed in action in what was then called the Great Conflict. Yasuo had been studying literature and he wondered whether he should pack in his studies to be with his family. But it was then he realized his talent for poetry could perhaps help him work out his feelings. And in doing so, Yasuo discovered that he wasn't so much sad as he was furious. He was angry at the stupidity of war and how it ripped families apart. He reasoned that when a soldier, like his father, died, he not only faced going to hell, but his death also put his family through hell's well. Perhaps, he thought, not only metaphorically, but physically. Two years later, while Yasuo's lament and woe culminated in a poem called Tamino's Nozi Goku. Translated to Tamino's Hell, it focuses on a child who loses his family in a tragedy. Although the tragedy is open to interpretation, some scholars believe that the Tamino of the title is a boy who murdered his parents. Though there are others who believe Tamino is a girl who experienced horrible abuses by her sister until she took revenge on her. Whatever the tragedy, Tamino soon finds himself or herself descending into Mugen Sigoku, akin to the Buddhist Avicii. It is the lowest level of hell, where the child is doomed to live out eternity in torment and agony. The poem begins, The older sister vomited blood, his younger sister vomited fire, and the cute Tamino vomited glass beads. But perhaps we should have included a warning before reciting that. Because in the century since the poem's publication, there have been whispers and rumors of a curse associated with the text, when it is read out loud. Legend seems to have started when filmmaker Terry Amasuji released a feature film adaptation of the poem only to die suddenly at age 47. Another urban legend states that a female university student staged a public reading of Tamino's Hell only to be killed herself shortly after. In 2004, author Yomida Inahiko incorporated the poem into his book, My Heart is Like a Stone Rolling Around. In the book, he put the following warning. If you by chance happen to read this poem out loud, after you will suffer from a terrible fate, which cannot be escaped. Soon after, the poem went viral, with internet users posting videos of themselves reading the poem aloud, with some reporting everything from nausea and headaches to accidents and unexpected deaths. Whether these rumors are true or not is up for interpretation, but when it comes to Tamino's hell, perhaps things are better left unsaid. Number 2. The Orphan Story 
1610, Martin de Leon Cardenas, a priest in the order of St. Augustine, disembarked from a galleon in a Spanish port, weary but excited. He had just made the long journey from Peru, where he'd spent months exploring and trying to convert Peruvians in the New World. As he settled back into his quarters, he drew determined to tell the world about what he'd seen during his adventures. Fierce battles, native ceremonies, pirates, and even pineapples. Putting Quill to pen, Father Martin combined his real-life adventures into a fictional story about a 14-year-old orphan who set sail on a ship to South America, discovering adventure and himself along the way. It's basically a 17th century version of Forrest Gump as the boy finds himself in the middle of a few famous events, and even crosses paths with Sir Francis Drake, the Spanish princess, and the Pope himself. The result was a 350-page historical novel called Historia del Huerfano, The Orphan Story. In 1622, proud of his work, the priest took his manuscript to a few publishers, only to have them turn him away at the door without question. It seems word was getting around that the Catholic Church in Spain wanted to put a stop to publish stories about the New World. It's believed details in such stories would give Spaniards the wrong impression of their efforts to colonize South America. Martin then tried to publish his novel secretly and anonymously under the name Andreas de Leon, but still found no buyers. Despite all his hard work and despite the thrilling tales he had to tell, the priest packed up the manuscript in a chest and locked it up. And there it remained for 343 years until 1965. In that year, a researcher at the Hispanic Society of America was going over some acquisitions and discovered the yellowed, though still intact, manuscript. Somehow, at some point, like its protagonist, the book had undertaken a perilous journey across the Atlantic from Spain to Manhattan. The book's discovery floored Antonio Rodriguez Bonino, an esteemed scholar of Spanish literature and a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. At the time, it was thought that the earliest New World novel had been published only in 1690s. But the orphan story pushed that date back half a century. Rodriguez Bonino immediately obtained the manuscript and set about editing a version for modern publication. After all, the book was a treasure trove of historical information, one he knew the world had to read to believe. The professor took a sabbatical from his university job to edit the book. Five years later, in 1970, he took a research trip to Madrid, where he was killed in a flu car accident at the age of 60. With no one willing to take up his mantle, the Rachel manuscript collected dust. Until 1984, when William C. Bryan, an associate professor of Spanish at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, rediscovered the book and set about finishing Rodriguez Monino's work. Bryan said he had big plans for the text. In 1986, he told the school's alumni magazine, Maybe Hollywood will want to do it. It would be an excellent movie, as love, intrigue, and adventure. Sadly, he would never live to see this happen. Five years after he started working on the book, Brian died at his home in McAllen, Texas. The victim of a sudden and mysterious disease at the age of 52. With his death, the orphan story went unpublished for another two decades. Until 2017, when Peruvian scholar Linda Palacios undertook the daunting and perhaps dangerous job of editing De Leon's manuscript. So far, however, she's been fine. When I started working on it, a lot of people told me about the curse, she told the Guardian at the time. I laughed it off, but I was a bit apprehensive at the same time. Though she did admit she told a close friend to burn the manuscript if something tragic should befall her. So what caused the seemingly innocuous adventure tale to be cursed? The answer might be found with its titular character. 
The Orvin story is a treacherous and dangerous journey for the protagonist, and sometimes he doesn't end up on the right side of things, a victim of all kinds of nefarious deeds. Given the book was written by a Catholic monk, perhaps the curse comes from the Almighty himself. As it is written in Exodus, you shall not abuse any orphan. If you do, my wrath will burn, and I will kill you. The book is available now wherever you buy books, that is, if you dare to incur the wrath of God. Number 1. The Grand Grimoire If the idea of a book of dark magic so powerful that has to be kept under lock and key sounds like something dreamed up by the writers of a Marvel movie, think again. Here's the dark hole featured in the Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness movie is based, in part, on a real book, The Grand Grimoire, otherwise known as the Red Dragon. Some scholars claim the text was written in 1522 by a man called Alabak the Egyptian, while others believe he simply transcribed and edited the contents of the book from a book that dated even further back to the 1200s. Whatever its origins, however, it is always said to have held such power that it has consistently been kept out of the public eye. In fact, it had never seen the light of day until 1750, when it was discovered inside the tomb of Solomon in Jerusalem. Once it was unearthed, it was secreted away by the Catholic Church and now resides in a dark corner of the Vatican's private archives. Over the centuries, copies, or at least transcriptions, of the book's four chapters have leaked out and found their way onto the market. While the copies currently available on Amazon are said to be mere counterfeit editions of the Grand Grimoire, many believe they still hold enough source material to make them dangerous. How dangerous? Let's put it this way. We called experts believe that the Grand Grimoire is an instruction manual on how to summon Lucifer himself. Some of his lower subordinates, like the demon Lucifero Focal. The Grimoire reveals is the Prime Minister of Hell's treasury, and who promises infinite riches to anyone brave enough to summon him. The problem, however, is that while the book is said to contain spells and invocations that would bring these demons into our world, it contains no instructions on how to craft the spells and build the weapons that would control them and make them yield to the invokers every command. In one chapter, there are even instructions on how to make a pact with the devil, where he would be able to take over the invoker's body and do his dirty work in human form. But the chapter also contains instructions on how to make the pact unfair to the devil, giving the invoker not only total control of his possession, but also the ability to cast the demon back to hell at any moment. Of course, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's thought that religious leaders feared anyone use the book to bring such hell demons to life, might forget the part where you need weapons and spells to control them, thereby unwittingly setting the devil loose on an unsuspecting populace. So in a way, perhaps the Vatican hiding the Grand Grimoire is for everyone's good. It might be hard to blame them. On June 6, 2020, two sisters, Biba and Nicole, we're enjoying a warm spring night in Frying Country Park outside of London. They were playing with glow sticks, watching the colors blur against the darkness, when 19 year old Daniel Hussein crept up on them with a kitchen knife. He stabbed the sisters two dozen times and then fled into the night. When the police eventually arrested Hussein for these brutal murders, they found a document he had written. A contract with Lucifer's Roe Focal, in which his deal with the devil was to sacrifice two women in return for hell's untold riches. Before his evil crimes, Hussein even signed his contract in blood and was said to have been waiting for the demon to close the deal, as it were. 
Was this tragic crime the result of a mentally ill young man? Or was there something more sinister at work? Today, the publicly available version of the Grand Grimoire is used in Haitian voodoo rituals. So it may be possible that out there, somewhere, a demon is in our midst. Number 3. Rhoda Toth Some superstitious people believe that the number 13 is inherently unlucky. 20 years after her lottery win, Rhoda Toth is also a believer. Rhoda and her husband, Alex, won Florida's $13 million jackpot on May the 4th, 1990. Normally, winning the lottery is the best day of someone's life. But, looking back, she said later, it was my worst day. Technically, the winning amount for the toss was $13,333,333.33. The toss selected to accept annual payments over 20 years in lieu of a lump sum payment. But, they obviously didn't do the math. Because they were both weary when their first check arrived, for $666,666.66. Another unlucky number, perhaps. At first, however, things seemed to be going great for the newfound millionaires. Rhoda was exceedingly generous with her new wealth. She bought cars and paid off mortgages for the people in her life. I felt sorry for them, Rhoda said later. We took care of family. We took care of friends. We took care of people we didn't even know. She and her husband traveled the world, something they never dreamed about in their Newport Ritchie trailer park when they only had $27 in the bank. Soon they moved out of their double wide mobile home into a 3,000 square foot mansion in an exclusive three golf course village called Hudson, Florida. Their mansion was complete with an ocean view from their Olympic-sized swimming pool. Unfortunately, the couple stuck out like a sore thumb in their new neighborhood. During the 1990s, the Toths also began making rounds on the talk show circuit, recounting their rags-to-riches story. In those circles, they found themselves rubbing elbows with Oprah Winfrey and Donald Trump. But... By the end of the decade, the good times began to evaporate. It turns out that Alex was also exceedingly generous with her money. He had apparently been freely giving out hundreds of thousands of dollars to casinos, and all he asked in return was a chance to play their games. He wasn't a very good player, unfortunately. Remember, math wasn't Alex's strong suit, which may be the reason why he also didn't calculate the correct amount of money he was supposed to pay on his taxes over the years. The IRS came to Hudson to remind him of the court order for an immediate back payment of just under $4 million. The problem was, the Toths didn't have it. And then, Alex got sick, suffering a physical and mental breakdown which required institutional care. With their bills and debts mounting, Rhoda turned to those friends she had been so generous with early on. Reggie says they were nowhere to be found when push came to shove. So the Toss made a deal with a Florida financial company that caters especially to lottery winners and financial straits. In return for signing over their 14 remaining annual lottery payouts, totaling around $9 million, the couple received a check for a mere $3 million. They had no choice, they said. Some of the $3 million went towards Alex's care and the rest went to the IRS, but it wasn't enough. In 2006, the IRS took the toss to court to recover the tax payments they were still owed. Alex died before the trial, age 60. Rhoda was sentenced to two years in federal prison for tax crimes. When she was released, Rhoda had nothing. She moved back into her old trailer park in Florida. 
although she now wired her car's battery for power and siphoned water from her neighbor's hose. Looking back, Rhoda cites the yearly check amounts as a big cause for bad luck. $666,666.66 Too many sixes, Rhoda said in 2010. Alex said it was evil money. And maybe he was right. Number 2. Suzanne Mullins In early January 1993, Suzanne Mullins walked into a convenience store in southwest Roanoke, Virginia and, on a whim, decided to buy a lottery ticket. When the clerk asked her what numbers she wanted to choose, she shrugged and said, let the machine decide. The lottery console, and perhaps fate, spit out the ticket with 3, 24, 31, 35, 42, and 44. And it turned out, those numbers were a winner. I almost had a stroke, Suzanne told the Associated Press at the time. But avoid this particular sequence of numbers if you play the lottery yourself. Because while Suzanne hit the jackpot of $4.2 million based on those lucky numbers, she faced nothing but misery and bad luck afterwards. Perhaps Suzanne should have paid attention to the ominous omens that came when she and her husband first walked into the Virginia Lottery offices to collect their winnings. All week after realizing they'd won, the Mullins made big plans with the money. They dreamed of exotic vacations, seaside villas, and fancy cars. But Suzanne and her husband, Tommy, were shocked when the lottery office handed them a check with only a few zeros. It seems Uncle Sam first takes a big cut, which lowered the take-home amount to just over $2.5 million instead of the $4.2 million they were expecting. Death and taxes are, of course, inevitable, just asked Rhoda Toth. But the Mullins were further confused to discover that maybe their win wasn't a windfall after all. In fact, they were told that their jackpot would be cut up into 20 yearly payments of just under $143,000. It's still a lot of money, of course, but it wouldn't buy the trips and cars they dreamed of. Tommy Mullins would have to keep his job as a union rep, and Suzanne would continue being a stay-at-home mom for their teenage daughter. As time moved along, the Mullins lived a comfortable life. Their daughter got married in the mid-1990s, and they spared no expense. But things went south after their daughter's new husband developed a medical condition that required around-the-clock care. He was uninsured, you see, so Suzanne agreed to pay for his well-being. As the doctor's bills began to pile up, Suzanne grew more embittered. The yearly checks just weren't enough. And the moms found themselves having to sell off their possessions in order to make ends meet. If only the state lottery paid out in one lump sum instead of having to wait 20 years. Then, in 1998, with Suzanne at her lowest point, it was as if the devil himself appeared in the kitchen with a solution. Through the internet, Suzanne learned about a company in Florida that catered to lottery winners with the same financial concerns. The same company that helped Rhoda Toth in her time of need. The company agreed to give Suzanne a $200,000 loan in return for signing over the next eight of those future yearly payments. So in return for the 200000 she agreed to give the company about $1 million of her future winnings. With no other choice, Suzanne made the deal with this devil. But at least a portion of that loan money went to pay for her son-in-law's funeral. When he died in 2000, he left his extended family nearly a million dollars in debt with interest compounding. Yet, in the early part of the new millennium, there was finally some good luck that may have helped Suzanne win the lottery in the first place. In 2001, the Virginia State Lottery changed its rules. 
It allowed former winners to claim the remainder of their jackpots in a lump sum. For Suzanne, that meant a check for just over a million bucks. After paying off the remaining medical debt and her $200,000 loan, it was looking as if she would break even. A telephone call from that financial company in Florida reminded her that while she paid them back the loan amount, they still expected those yearly checks for the next five years. That, of course, was the deal she signed. Unable to pay, the company sued Suzanne, who used the little money she had to hire an attorney, Michael Hart. Appearing in a Roanoke court in 2004, Mr. Hart told the judge that the Mullins were simply a victim of bad luck. It's been a hard road, Hart told the court. It's just not been jet planes to the Bahamas. Unmoved, the judge ordered Suzanne to repay the company its expected money. By 2008, Suzanne Mullins was broke and bankrupt, one of the unluckiest lottery winners you'd ever meet. By coincidence, that same year, a man named Henry Mullins of Norfolk, Virginia, won the state's Win for Life lottery, earning a $1,000 check every week until his dying day. Henry is of no relation, however, to Frank Mullins, who won a million dollar payout for the Virginia State Lottery in 1994, a year after Suzanne won. Looking back, it was as if the fate knew it got wrong with Suzanne Mullins. It was trying to make amends to a few Virginians with the same surname. Fate can be funny that way. Number 1. William Bud Post Growing up, William Bud Post had a tough life. Orphaned at a young age, he and his siblings were split up and he spent time in a juvenile lockup as a youth. Later, as a young man, he served a short stint in the army before he began roaming the Northeast, picking up work where he could find it. He served as a carnival worker, spray painter, short order cook, and a circus sidehand. But things began to really turn for Bud when he met and fell in love with his wife. Together, they settled down in Pennsylvania and would go on to have a handful of children together. By the mid-1980s, their kids had flown the nest and Bud looked forward to a quiet middle age with his one true love. Until his wife died sadly and suddenly, leaving him a widower and very much alone at the age of 45. And the misfortune continued. Soon after his wife's death, a workplace accident left Bud unable to earn a living. Now surviving on a government disability check, Bud was forced to sell his house and move into a dilapidated apartment in nearby Erie, Pennsylvania. One chilly April afternoon in 1987, while walking through the city lamenting his bad luck, Bud saw smoke rising from a two-level apartment building. Without thinking and relying on his army basic training, Bud ran up the stairs to the second level and found a terrified three-year-old boy cowering in the corner. Despite his nagging injury, Bud picked up the child and carried him down to the street, saving his life and earning the respect of the firefighters arriving on the scene. Days later, the fire department presented Bud Post with a plaque commemorating his heroism. He became something of a neighborhood celebrity. But more importantly, the daring fire rescue seemed to spur something inside Bud. Friends reported they grew more optimistic about the future. So they weren't surprised when one day he went to the store and came home with $40 worth of lottery tickets. A purchase, he said, that only left him with $2.46 in the bank. I just had a feeling, Bud told the Associated Press in 1988. I can't explain it. I get feelings, like premonitions. And Bud's premonition, maybe some would call it karma, paid off. On February 26, 1988, William Bud Post was overjoyed to learn that one of the tickets he bought won him a whopping $16.1 million in Pennsylvania's Super 7 Lottery. 
However, as we've demonstrated so far, there was a catch with a payout. The jackpot payment was due to come out in yearly payments, with annual payments of about half a million dollars over the next quarter century. But surely, he assumed, half a million dollars was enough to live the high life on, right? Unfortunately, Bud Post didn't have a premonition about how wrong he would become. Like many lottery winners, Bud went shopping. Television sets, motorcycles, cars, trucks, small engine airplanes, and even a yacht in Tennessee. But a few hard luck bad investments followed. And then came the lawsuit. Ann Craprick, Bud's landlord at the time of his big win, and the person who accompanied him to collect his first check in the lottery offices, felt cheated. She claimed that of the $40 Bud used to buy the tickets, $20 came from her. And that, her lawyer said, entitled her to half the winnings. Bud's lawyer told her she didn't have a hope in hell of getting a payment. But the judge was inclined to disagree in order that Bud's future annual checks be deposited into a bank until a jury could sort out the he said, she said mess. Three years went by and the bills for those purchases and investments came due. And with no money coming in to pay them off, Bud Post was in bad shape. I faced the loss of everything, he told the paper later. I faced starvation. Bud's new house was literally falling apart, with him unable to pay for repairs. When one bill collector surprised Bud by approaching the house unannounced, Bud fired a shotgun into the air to scare him off. The police were not impressed. Also impressed was Bud's little brother, Jeff, who grew bitter that Bud was fittering away his good fortune. Convinced he'd do a better job at being a millionaire, Jeff slyly had his brother change his will to give him a large chunk of the winnings in the event of his death. And then Jeff hired a hitman to get the ball rolling. Unaware that the gun for hire was an undercover Florida cop. Bud's new wife, terrified by the prospect of being targeted for murder, walked out. Then sued him for alimony. And then the judgment came down that perhaps confirmed Bud's suspicion that his money was cursed. A Pennsylvania court decided the landlady, Ann Craprick, indeed was legally entitled to half of Bud's jackpot. He was forced to sign over $4.1 million to her and almost a million dollars to her lawyers for good measure. After taxes, Bud Post was left with $4.7 million. But rather than accepting a quarter million dollars every year until 2014, Bud wanted to be done with the whole lottery nightmare. He auctioned the rights to his future payouts to a lottery finance company, pocketing just over a million dollars in cash. Bud then sold off his vehicles and luxury items to help him pay off his debt. But he refused to get rid of his yacht. He said he hoped to start over by opening a charter fishing business where his boat was docked in Tennessee. And that's where the police found him after a judge put out a warrant for his arrest in 1998. It turns out that the bill collector wanted Bud charged with attempted murder for the shotgun warning. As Bud sat in jail for months after a verdict of armed assault, he looked back on his life and realized something. I was happier before I won the money, he told a reporter. Despite his earlier premonition, Bud Post probably never envisioned at the time of his death in 2006, at the age of 66, he'd be sitting in a small two-bedroom apartment, living on his meager $400 a week disability check. He'd sold off everything of value he owned to make ends meet. But the one thing he never sold, the last thing, that was found hanging on the smoke-stained wall was the plaque from the Erie Fire Department commemorating his heroic good deed back in 1987. Whoever said no good deed goes unpunished has probably never won the lottery.
Number 3, 1911 Grafton Stiff 28-32 PS. The case can be made that World War I came about because of a sandwich. That's at least how one story goes. On June 28, 1914 in Sarajevo, a few Serbian men got into their heads that they needed to assassinate the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. As Ferdinand drove through the town in an ornate open-top limousine, one of the men threw a hand grenade at the car. But it bounced off the side and rolled into the street. It exploded, but didn't kill the Archduke, who was driven away at a high speed. While the man who tossed the grenade was captured, the other conspirators were not, and they dispersed into the crowd. Meanwhile, the Archduke was taken to the town hall, unscathed, but showing great concern for those in the path of the explosion. Elsewhere in the city, one of the conspirators had a rumble in his tummy. So he headed to Schiller's Deli and lined up to buy a sandwich. As the man, Reveal of Princep, stood in line, pondering his choice of condiments, the Archduke ordered his men to drive him back to where the grenade had gone off so he could see if he could help with the injured. But the driver got lost and frantically turned down side streets and heavily crowded boulevards, hoping to find his way back to the spot of the explosion. Imagine Gravillo's surprise when he saw the big carriage-style limo stuck in the busy traffic inside the deli. As the driver tried to back the car up, it somehow stalled. And there was the Archduke and his wife, sitting in the back, unprotected. Abandoning his lunch order, Gravillo took a browning handgun from his jacket, stepped into the street, and fired two bullets they killed both Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, thereby essentially kicking off the First World War five weeks later. Sure, the sandwich shell may be a bit apocryphal, but it's a fun story. And so was our story about how Franz Ferdinand may have actually been the victim of a cursed diamond. Check out our video, Three Cursed Families, for that one. But could it be possible the Habsburg curse trickled down into the fancy limousine Ferdinand was riding in on the day he was murdered. Because after the assassination, the bright red limo he was in apparently went on to have a very strange and tragic history. After Ferdinand was killed, the car, a Grafton stiff double phantom, went back to the person who lent it to the Archduke. A man named Count Franz von Harek of the Austrian army. But that all changed when war broke out, according to the book Stranger Than Science by Frank Edwards. Count Francis' house was raided, and, as a spoil of war, his car was taken by his captors. While driving one day, the car's new owner, an army captain, plowed into two Croatian peasants, killing them and sending him down an embankment where he slammed into a tree. The captain was killed in the crash, seatbelts weren't a thing back then, but the car was still in drivable condition. The Yugoslavian state official had the car fixed up and appropriated it as his own personal vehicle. It was long before another crash threw the official out of the limo, causing his arm to slice clean off. As he recovered in the hospital, the official ordered the car to be destroyed believing that it might be cursed. One of his physicians, Dr. Circus, overheard the claim and laughed. The good doctor didn't believe in curses, so he offered the official a pittance for the vehicle and took possession a short while after. Things seemed fine for a few weeks until a passerby drove upon a scene that the car flipped over in the road and the doctor flattened underneath it. But the thing with the Grafenstith limo you see is that it was built like a tank. The doctor's widow sold it to a local jeweler who had it repaired right before he died by suicide. 
The next owner, another doctor, who suddenly lost his patient roster after taking possession of it. He gave the car to a Swiss race car driver who drove it over a retaining wall and died in the process. Then came the local farmer who thought he could use the now beat up junker to haul grain. But he lost control of the car on the way to the market and also died in a crash. A mechanic named Turbo Hirschfield took the wreckage off the hands of the farmer's family to restore the car to proper working order. It looked so nice and new, he decided to drive himself and some guests to a local wedding. You can probably see where this is going. Hirschfield and four guests died in a crash. In all, the car supposedly claimed the lives of 16 people after its part in the start of the war to end all wars. It was eventually put on display at a museum in Austria where curator Karl Brunner is said to have been highly protective of the car, not allowing anyone to even touch it. When the Allies bombed Austria during World War II, the museum was decimated and Brunner was killed. But the limo survived. Apparently, it still has some work to do and some curses to hand out, perhaps. So if you ever find yourself at the Austrian Museum of Military History, do not try to cross the velvet rope and definitely don't climb inside. Number 2, 1964 Dodge 330 Carol Beverwick's car was haunted. She was certain of it. Each night she would park her 1981 Dodge Aries in her garage in Indiana and lock the car's doors by pushing each log knob down. Then, each morning, she would come out to find the car unlocked. This happened night after night until she summoned the courage to see for herself what was happening. One night in 1999, Carol locked the car's doors and waited in the garage. After a little while, she was startled when all the locks all clicked open at the same time. Terrified and not knowing what to do, she asked the call on radio show about the demon in her vehicle. Have you tried replacing the fuse? The host asked. So it turned out that Carol Beverwick's Dodge wasn't haunted after all. But there's a Dodge in Maine that just might be, and it has the body count to prove it. The current car in question is a 1964 Dodge 330LE, and according to its owner, Wendy Allen, it's been the subject of scorn and speculation for years in her town of Old Orchard Beach. According to Allen, the car was purchased new by the OOB Police Department back in 64 and painted up to become a police cruiser complete with flashing cherries on the top. Given that Old Orchard Beach was, and still is, a very small seaside town relying mainly on tourist dollars, the car was also pressed into service by the local fire department. For two decades, the old Dodge acted as a first responder transport, an ambulance, and even a hearse as the need arose. Dozens of firefighters and police officers rode the car at one time or another. And that continued into the 80s, two decades after it came off the production line. When it was finally retired, it was sold to Wendy Allen's family and repainted a rusty copper color. Eventually, however, the car broke down, and with no desire to fix it, it sat abandoned and covered with a tarp on Wendy's property. And that's when she says the rumors began. As in many small towns, the grapevine in Old Orchard Beach began to buzz that the car was haunted. The town gossip pointed to the supposed 1964 suicide of a local cop in the car as the first instance of something unholy under the hood. As the legend of the car grew, so did the look he lose. Alan says that over the years, she's had to chase off more than a few curious kids as they tried to steal parts of the car as souvenirs. 
word of the Dodge's demonic doings eventually made their way to an elderly, church-going woman in the town who grew determined to cast the devil out of the derelict 330. This was in early 2001. A couple of months later, this God-fearing woman was decapitated when she drove under an 18-wheeler. For many of the woman's church friends, this was proof of her suspicions. They repeatedly tried to destroy the car during clandestine nighttime missions to Wendy Allen's backfield. Those attempts proved unsuccessful, but the car's legend grew. More and more local thrill seekers dared each other to go, at least get close enough to touch the cursed Dodge. One of those people, according to town lore, was Matthew Paul Cushing. On February 19, 2008, Matthew and his buddies snuck onto the property and vandalized the car. The next day, Matthew killed his family's dog, then lay in wait for the rest of his clan to come home. As each family member came through the door, first his younger half-brother, then his mother, and then his stepfather, Matthew incapacitated them with a stun gun and then stabbed each one to death. Then he set fire to his house in Old Orchard Beach. During his trial, Matthew pleaded guilty to the triple murder, thus denying the world any kind of explanation for what he had done. The curse's body count might have remained at four had it not been for the events a year and a half later, when former OOB police officer Bruce Savoy shot and killed his wife before turning the gun on himself. According to Wendy Allen, Savoy had been one of the officers who had frequently found himself in the Dodge while on the job in the old days. Given two murder-suicides, Allen says that a few members of the church came to her property to rip the car apart, taking off with pieces of the vehicle to be scattered far and wide. One of those men, Allen believes, was the former Congregational Minister, Dan Randall. On December 18, 2016, Pastor Dan brought a shotgun to his ex-wife's house, shot his daughter, and then turned it on himself. These days, the old Dodge, or what's left of it, sits covered up by a torn tarp on Wendy Allen's property, covered with weeds and brush, perhaps waiting for its next victim. Number 1. 1955 Porsche Spider. James Dean had a clause in his contract with Warner Brothers Studios that, under no circumstances, was he to race cars while in production on a movie. So when the actor wrapped filming on the film Giant in the fall of 1955, he wasted no time in trading in his Porsche 356 Super Speedster for an even faster car. To enter in an upcoming race in Salinas, California, 300 miles north of LA. Dean's new car, a 550 Porsche Spider, was only less than 200 produced by the German automaker that year. Upon seeing his new car for the first time, Dean's friend and fellow actor, Alec Guinness, supposedly told James, If you get into that car, you will be dead by this time next week. Undaunted by Obi-Wan's prediction, Dean had Los Angeles artists paint racing stripes down the side, as well as the name Little Bastard, a nickname given him by Jack Warner that went with Dean's Hollywood reputation as being difficult to work with. And that character trait became evident on the morning of September 30th, 1955, when Dean and a few friends set out to bring the car to the racetrack in Salinas. Those friends begged him to tow the car to the track. Dean stubbornly insisted on driving it himself. A speeding ticket soon followed, perhaps another unheeded omen about what was to come. After a late day stop for cokes and gas in Shalome, Dean was eager to get back behind the wheel. Horse mechanic Wolf Weatherreich climbed into the spider with him, and the two took off down California's Highway 466 as the sun sank towards the horizon. It was that low sun, some experts claim, that led a 22-year-old college student named Don Turnipseed to not see Dean's low-riding spider 
as he veered across the highway on the Route 41. Dean plowed his new spider into the driver's side of the forward sedan at upwards of 85 miles per hour. Hollywood stunt driver Bill Hickman was following Dean in a station wagon when the crash occurred. All I remember is an explosion and a great cloud of smoke and dust, Hickman said in 1973. When I first got to him, his forehead was caved in, and so was his chest. Wolf Ritherreich suffered minor injuries, but Dean's death at the age of 24 sent shockwaves through Hollywood. Though he had only been acting for a few years, at the time of his death, Dean was already being heralded as the next Marlon Brando. One Hollywood columnist said the impact of his death on Tinseltown rivaled only that of the sun passing of Madney Idol, Rudolph Valentino, some 30 years earlier. Dean's death instantly elevated him to legend status, a place he still holds today alongside the likes of Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley. As such, it's not surprising that anything connected with James Dean's life or death also holds the status of being legendary. That includes the car in which he was killed. Dean's aluminum body spider, though ripped apart like tinfoil in the crash, still had some highly valued and very valuable car parts inside of it. A few months after the crash, the wreckage from the car was purchased for $1,000 from a junkyard by Dr. William Erschrick, a Beverly Hills surgeon and part-time road racer. Erschrick extracted the motor, had some repairs done, and put it into his own race car. He then sold the Spider's rear tires to another driver out of New York. He gave the transmission and suspension to his friend, a fellow doctor, Troy McHenry, who was also on the amateur racing circuit. On Sunday, October 21st, 1956, doctors Erschrick and McHenry hit their accelerators for a race in Bonoma, California. On the fourth lap, Erschrick hit the gravel and flipped his car, which hit a tree. Thankfully, he was okay. But just one lap later, McHenry lost control of his Porsche and crashed into a hail bay, which killed him instantly. Two days later, those two rear tires blew simultaneously, sending the New York race car driver into a ditch with life-threatening injuries. Perhaps the connection between Dean and death was a little too close for Erschrick. Though he told reporters at the time he was not a superstitious person, he wasted no time in selling the remainder of the spider's wreckage to noted Hollywood car customizer George Barris. Barris, who would go on to create the 1960s Batmobile, the Dukes of Hazzard's General Lee, a kit from Knight Rider, had planned to rebuild Dean Spider as a show car. There was something strange about that particular car, Barris wrote in his 1974 autobiography, Cars of the Stars. A feeling, bad vibrations, an aura. Things got off to an ominous start, he says, as the mechanic had both of his legs crushed while trying to offload the wreckage in his shop. Discovering the car was far beyond his reconstructive abilities, Barris loaned the wreckage to various safety organizations so it could be displayed as a cautionary tale about speeding. It was during one of these exhibitions that the car somehow fell off its stand, crushing the hip of a teenage bystander. According to Barris, who, it should be pointed out, was something of a showman, the car's wreckage also indirectly maimed a thief who was trying to steal the steering wheel. Later, while housed in a storage container, the car mysteriously caught fire, however, suffering surprisingly little damage. Barris went on to write, quote, Everything that car touched has turned to tragedy, unquote. Thankfully, however, the car didn't have a long reign of terror. In 1960, while being transported by train to Los Angeles, James Dean's poor spider mysteriously vanished from its boxcar. It remains missing to this day. But perhaps the curse lives on, even without the car. 
In 1981, mechanic Wolfred Reich, who was riding with Dean when he died, was himself killed in a car crash in Germany. This was five years after he went mad and stabbed his wife, who survived the attack. Number 3. The Centerfold Curse In January 1986, the football team for the University of Iowa, the Hawkeyes, were invited to Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion in Hollywood on the day after the Rose Bowl. But the visit wasn't a celebration because during the game, the Hawkeyes got crushed by the UCLA Bruins. Oddly, this has happened to a sports team invited to frolic in the famed waterfall Grotto. The year before, baseball St. Louis Cardinals dropped by the mansion before promptly losing the World Series. And the year before that, the team from the University at Illinois got beat by UCLA in the Rose Bowl after a similar invitation from Half. As Hefner himself said in 1986, there may be a curse here. Yet, while it's true there may be a curse involving Playboy, it has nothing to do with sports. In fact, it's far more deadly, because Playboy's Playmate models seem to die unexpectedly and young at an alarming rate. The most recent victim of the curse may be model Ashley Mattingly. She took her own life in 2020 at the age of 33. There have been a handful of Playmate suicides in the magazine's 69-year history. The 1958 Playmate, Cheryl Kubert, died by suicide in 1989 at age 51. As did 1964 cover girl Ashlyn Martin in 1991 when she was only 45. In 1974, 30-year-old Paige Young killed herself with a gun. As did 1981 model Debbie Boostrom in 2008 at age 53. Disease has also taken its toll with at least 13 models succumbing to everything from cancer to colon blockages to asthma attacks. Car accidents also call Playboy alumni too, it seems. The most famous example is that of Jane Mansfield who appeared in Playboy in 1955. It was killed in a car wreck 12 years later at only 34. Her three-year-old daughter, Mariska Hardigay, would go on to TV stardom in Law & Order SVU. For years, rumors swirled that Mansfield had been decapitated in the wreck, with her car fear underneath the semi-truck. But that rumor turned out to be untrue. The Undertaker later said her head was attached as much as mine is. An accident of another kind ended the life of Eve Mayer, a playmate from 1955. She was one of the 550 people who perished in the Tenor Life disaster, a runaway collision between two passenger jets in the Canary Islands in 1977. Eight years later, model and actress Carol Wayne who regularly appeared in the popular Art Fern's Tea Time movie sketches on The Night Show with Johnny Carson, died by drowning in a mysterious incident that some still call suspicious. She was only 42 years old. The March 1967 issue of Playboy perhaps holds the distinction of being particularly cursed. That issue featured Fran Gerard, who appeared in the Miss March centerfold wearing glasses, a first for the magazine. Gerard died in 1985 at 37 under mysterious circumstances, with some speculating murder, while others insinuating it was suicide. Also in the March 1967 issue was a photo spread featuring actress Sharon Tate, who would be murdered by the Manson family only two years later. There were other Playmate murders as well. Dorothy Stratton was only 20 when she was shot and killed by her boyfriend in a jealous rage involving director Peter Bogdanovich. Her story was later made into two movies. One being Star 80 with actress Meryl Hemingway 
who perhaps know something about curses. The suicide of her grandfather, Ernest Hemingway, in 1961, kicked off what some call the Hemingway Curse. In 1997, Star Stowe, who posed for Playboy 20 years earlier, was found in some bushes behind a pharmacy in Coral Springs, Florida. She had been strangled, and her death is linked to the work of a Florida serial killer. As of 2022, the killer has not been caught. Perhaps the most frequent Playboy model COD is OD. At least seven women have found their end as the result of overdoses. 1992 centerfold Anne Nicole Smith was only 39 when she overdosed on sleeping pills in 2007, leaving her five-month-old daughter behind. Between 1953 and 2015, there were 739 women who appeared in Playboy's infamous centerfold spread. Of those, 39 women all met untimely deaths all before the age of 55. That's about a 5% mortality rate. So, what the hell is going on with Playboy Playmates? The answer may lie in the story behind the first death of a Playboy subject. The overdose, or was it murder, of Marilyn Monroe in 1862, when she was only 32. Monroe appeared in the magazine's very first issue in December 1953. However, she did not pose willingly. The magazine's founder, Hugh Hefner, purchased a number of new snapshots of Monroe taken by a CD photographer before she became a movie star, and have proceeded to publish them without Marilyn's permission or knowledge, a move that mortified the actress and threatened her career. I never even received a thank you from all those who made millions off the photos, she was quoted as saying in the book, Marilyn, Her Life in Her Own Words. I even had to buy a copy of the magazine to see myself in it. Well, I could say that Playboy's entire enterprise was launched on the back of Marilyn Monroe's nude body and by the unscrupulous hands of Hugh Hefner. When Hef died in 2017, he was interred at the Westwood Cemetery in Hollywood. In a crypt, they bought directly next to Marilyn Monroe's, so that he and Marilyn could be side by side for eternity, despite the fact that he never even met her, and yet made a fortune off her without her consent. Perhaps the impetus for a deadly karmic curse, if there ever was one. Number 2. Demon vs. Rapper Sometimes the victim of a curse may bring it upon themselves. Case in point, rapper Post Malone. Long a fan of the paranormal, in 2018, Malone accepted an invitation to appear on the television show Ghost Adventures. The episode featured a trip to Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum, a Las Vegas sideshow which houses Bagan's impressive collection of supernatural objects and dark memorabilia. Inside, you'll find Charles Manson's television, the rocking chair that inspired the movie The Conjuring, and the transaxle supposedly once housed in the body of James Dean's ill-fated poor spider. Check out our video on three deadly haunted cars for more on that terrifying story. But one particular object in Bagan's fast collection is a Dybbuk box. A wine cabinet said to contain a demonic spirit from Jewish folklore. The story behind the box is a little murky, with the original owner, Kevin Manis, was recanting his version of its supernatural origin. Regardless, producer Sam Raimi did go on to produce a 2012 movie called Possession that is inspired by the Dybbuk box's demonic history. In 2016, Bagan purchased the box to add to his eclectic collection and continues to relate its story to anyone he specifically invites to see the box up close. The legend goes that there is a demon in the box that attaches itself to anyone who opens the box and peers inside. Then the demon stays with that person, 
waiting for the moment when that person commits a sin. Only after the subject of the demon's interest commits the sin can the demon gain enough spiritual strength to attack that person as a punishment. Over Superstar Post Malone, who was facing the box when Began opened it during Ghost Adventures, the Dybbuk is probably not the type of demon you want to have on your shoulder. Especially when you live the wildlife of one of the world's top music stars. According to the show's producer, at the moment Malone came in contact with the box, a glowing orc could be seen on the videotape of the encounter. Sensing enough was enough, Malone bolted from the room displaying the box. But perhaps the damage was already done. Malone's episode of Ghost Adventures was taped in June 2018. The first appearance of the Dybbuk Demon occurred only weeks later when, according to Malone's friend DJ Smitty, the rapper began complaining of mysterious bite marks up and down his arm, even though he had been alone on his tour bus at the time. Malone began to suspect that the Dybbuk box had something to do with the bites, and his suspicions were confirmed on August 21, 2018 when the private Gulfstream jet Malone was flying in had two tires explode in flight, prompting a harrowing emergency landing as smoke filled the cabin. Two weeks later, while driving in his Rolls Royce Wrath, Malone was T-boned at an intersection in West Hollywood. And though he was not harmed, he was shocked to soon learn that while he was dealing with the fallout from the car accident, thieves broke into his former home. Malone was not there, but security cameras caught the thieves calling out for Malone and searching the house trying to find him, perhaps to do him harm. A year later, on New Year's Eve 2019, while performing live on ABC's Countdown show, Malone fell off the stage and into the crowd. After we opened this Dybbuk box, Malone told Seth Meyers in 2021, it was really, really odd stuff. Unfortunately for Malone, the odd stuff didn't stop there. Even three years after his experience with the Dybbuk box at Zach Bagans Museum, it seems Malone may still be haunted by the demon in charge of counting his sins. As recently as September 2022, Post Malone had to seek medical attention after falling into an open trap door on stage in St. Louis, Missouri. Doctors diagnosed him with a fractured rib and forced him to cancel his tour dates for a month. When he finally made it back on the stage in Atlanta, Georgia on October 19, 2022, Malone fell into yet another hole in the stage, this time twisting his ankle. In response to his woes since his encounter with the Dybbuk box, Malone once tweeted, Why does God hate me? The answer, however, may not lie with God at all, but rather a demon bent on retribution for his indiscretions. Number 1. Development Hell The discovery came on a Wednesday. Around 4.30 p.m. on March 26, 1969, a police cruiser in Biloxi, Mississippi pulled up behind an idling automobile parked on the side of the road. As they got out to investigate, the cops immediately noticed a rubber garden hose attached to the vehicle's exhaust pipe. With the other end of the hose having been wedged in the driver's side window. The occupant of the car, who the coroner later said died by suicide, was 32-year-old Ken Tool. New Orleans officers soon knocked on the door of the home of the man's parents, who were overcome with grief. Their son, they said, had been on a road trip, hoping to get over about a depression. Ken was a writer, his mother explained. He had boxes of manuscripts in his room. But all of them had been turned down by publishers. One editor called his latest comic novel utterly pointless. It seems Ken just couldn't see a future in which he'd become a published writer, which led him down that side road and into the afterlife. He had left his latest manuscript atop his dresser in his childhood bedroom at home. But Ken's mother, Thelma, had always believed in her son. She knew he was a great writer 
if only she could get his work into the right hands. Having left Ken's room exactly as he left it, Thelma eventually summoned the courage to pick up his last manuscript, collecting dust on his armoire. For the next ten years, she wrote letter after letter, trying to get the book published. Then, in the late 1970s, he finally landed on the desk of editor Walker Percy, who saw promise in the work. He polished it, and printed it, and sent it to bookstores. That novel, A Confederacy of Dunces, would win the Pulitzer Prize. And it would make Ken Toole, John Kennedy Toole, one of the most celebrated American authors of the 20th century, a decade after his death. The New Republic called it one of the funniest books ever written. So it's no wonder that even before the book hit stores, a young executive at Fox Studios, Scott Kramer, scooped up the film rights to Dunces. In turn, he got the King of Late Night, Johnny Carson, to come aboard as a producer. Johnny said that he thought the comedian Richard Pryor might be right to star. To Saturday Night alum John Belushi, however, that casting wasn't right at all. The main character in Dunces is Ignatius J. Riley, an overweight, overeducated, and underemployed 30 something. Not unlike Belushi himself at the time. He convinced Carson that he, not Pryor, should be the star of the film. And he almost got his wish. On June 9, 1980, Pryor set himself on fire while trying to freebase cocaine. Publicly, it was ruled an accident. My family members later said they believed it was a suicide attempt. With Pryor out of the picture, as it were, Lucy got himself cast as a 300 pound hero of Dunce's. He even began to pack on pounds more fit with Riley's described bulk. Then, in 1982, with filming scheduled to begin in New Orleans, Josine Bold, the director of Louisiana's Film Commission, was shot dead by her husband in a murder-suicide. As the film commission regrouped, the movie was temporarily put on hold, which gave John Belushi, who had a history of his own substance abuse, just enough time to overdose in Hollywood's Chateau Marimont Hotel at the age of 32. Soon after, Johnny Carson let his option on the script lapse, and the film went into what Hollywood insiders call development hell. Over the next few years, a few more attempts were made to get Dunces on film. Producer Steve Tisch picked up the rights in 1983. Sadly, his daughter would take her own life. Thelma Toole died in 1984 after an unexpected illness. In 1988, director John Waters was hired to direct a reimagined movie of the book. He even had his Ignatius comic actor and singer Divine star of his cult classic film Pink Flamingos but Divine passed away suddenly in his sleep in March of that year he was 42 years old putting the project's future in question in 1993 Paramount Pictures bought the film rights to the book for upwards of 3 million dollars and tapped Groundhog Day director Harold Ramis to head it up Ramis thought that his old SCTV friend and co-star, John Candy, would make a perfect Ignatius. The Canadian comic actor had not only the heft, but the acting chops to do it. But Candy's sudden heart attack death just a year later put the movie back on the shelf. In the mid-90s, former NBC executive Wonderkin, Brandon Tartikoff, came aboard as one of the film's producers. Thanks to his great relationship with NBC, he thought SNL superstar Chris Farley would be the perfect choice for the lead. Would Farley be interested in taking his first serial comic starring role? Farley was more than interested. But sadly, before production got any further, Tartikoff died of Hodgkin lymphoma in August 1997. He was 48 years old. Four months later, Farley suffered his own overdose at the age of 33. A year later, Steven Soderbergh and Scott Rudden launched a lawsuit against Paramount 
over rights issues with the book. The suit languished in courts for years until around 2005 when the lawsuit was settled. Plans were being made to restart the production of the film starring another SNL alum, Will Ferrell. But the story of a confederacy of dunces is set in New Orleans. And Hurricane Katrina that summer decimated the city and many of the book's real life locations. After that, the idea of turning Tool's book into a movie had been hanging around Hollywood for a quarter century. And by that time, the movie had so much bad mojo around it, no one could ever pull together enough money for financiers to get it going again. Harold Ramis, once a champion of the film, died unexpectedly in 2014 of an autoimmune disorder. As of 2012, it's estimated a confederacy of dunces has gone through no less than two dozen producers, half a dozen scripts, and earned millions of dollars via rights and options. For believers that the film is cursed, however, they're happy to let well enough alone and leave this project in developmental hell, good and dead. And maybe that's what the spirit of John Kennedy Toole would have wanted after all. The deaths of Belushi and Candy had a powerful aura to the curse, one of Dunce's many screenwriters, Stephen Fry, told The Guardian in 2018 which the life and unhappy death of its young author had already caused to surround the book. Maybe it's possible that the same demons that plagued Ken Toole in 1969 and caused him to take his own life are continuing to protect his legacy from the other side by ensuring that a possible film adaptation remains very much dead. Perhaps producers might do well to remember what author Stephen King once wrote in another kind of book, Sometimes dead is better. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.